Hey everyone, today I'm going to be doing a video that's slightly different from what I normally do. Um, I'm going to be addressing a video that I recently watched, uh, put out by Nothing Fancy, that was talking about debunking the 10 top tactical myths. Um, now, I've been watching Nothing Fancy for years and years and years. He's probably one of the first gun channels I ever started watching. Uh, he's been doing this a long time. He puts out a lot of really great content. Um, you know, I'm an active subscriber. I plan on continuing to be an active subscriber. Um, but when he specifically talks about the tactical community, I, I f have a feeling, or I, I get the sense that he's being a little divisive, um, just my perception. Uh, and so I, I kind of wanted to get a, give a different perspective and kind of comment on some of the points that he brought up in the video and kind of my, my own viewpoints on, on the topic and on the tactical world. You know, Nut and Fancy has a huge subscriber base. He's got over 600,000 subscribers, at least as of this point in time. So he hears from a lot of people. So I'm sure a lot of these uh, myths that he talks about are ones that he's heard multiple times from multiple people. Um, so I, I, I'm not arguing that these myths aren't out there. Um, however, I feel that for the most part, a lot of the myths that he brings up are not really pervasive in, in the tactical community. Um, I'm not sure who's, who are saying these things, but... Um, I, I don't think that they should represent the, the group of people as a whole. So just to give you, get out my biases right off the bat and kind of tell you where I'm coming from with this. Uh, my personal background, uh, I was in the Air Force, and when I did that, I was in a non-combat job. Uh, I, you know, I was a aircraft maintainer, worked on F-15s, so I definitely wasn't a door kicker, was not, uh, you know, special operations or anything like that. Um, after getting out of the military, um, I, I sought a bunch of training. Um, I, I myself became an instructor, uh, worked actively as an instructor for over a year. Uh, we'll hopefully be doing that again here in the near future. Um, so just letting you know that um, those are my biases that will co probably come across. But I want to make that known so you can see kind of where I'm coming from and hopefully kind of why I have a d slightly different perspective on things than Nut and Fancy does. You know, in, in my opinion, Nut and Fancy, um, he has the ear of a lot of people. He has a huge umbrella uh, of people that he, that he influences. And I think he has a really big potential to be an ambassador um, for everyone in, in the Pro 2A community. Um, however, you know, I, I, I really think that any time that he talks about the tactical community, um, he he does it in a very derisive tone. I think that um, it doesn't do anything but kind of create and enhance this divide between people in the tactical community and people outside of it. Again, I think a lot of the points that he makes are valid. Um, however, as a whole, I think uh, it, it's either a misrepresentation, uh, an unconscious misre misrepresentation, or at least or at least an, a an inaccurate representation of, of what the tactical community has to offer and you know what the beliefs of most of the people in that community are. So by no means in this video do I want to try to be a, sound like I'm attacking Nut and Fancy. I have a lot of respect for him. He does a lot of good good things. Uh, I just want to put you know my voice out there uh, to contribute to this conversation. Hopefully in an art in an art in an articulate way. Great example of that. Um, in a, in a way that I can be effectively communicating my ideas and hopefully be uh, constructive in in this conversation. So that that's my goal. Um, so let me go right into the first uh, first point. And just so you know, I have my notes down there. So if I'm glancing down, that's what I'm doing. Um, the first myth that he brings up is that you need to attend a tactical shooting course uh, to be a good shooter. Um, now, I, I think where I differ from nothing fancy is I separate being a good shooter from being a good gunfighter. I think those are two wholly separate things. Um, nothing fancy just... Uh, is, is frequently referring in his videos to being a good shooter, being a good shooter, being a good shooter, uh, but he never really hits on the, the concept of being a good gunfighter. Um, and I, I'll be the first to admit, Nut Fancy is a fantastic shooter. Uh, you watch any of his review videos and you see the targets that he rolls in front of the camera, um, even at you know extended distance, uh, extended ranges, um, he's able to do some really impressive things with those guns. So uh, by no means am I saying Nut Fancy is not a good shooter. So I want to make make that well known. Um, but to me, being like I said, being a good shooter and a gunfighter are two separate things. So let me define my terms. To me, being a good shooter means that you can put your rounds where you want them to go. You can put holes where you want them. However, being a good gunfighter is being able to put holes where you want them while also not getting any more holes in you during that process. 
Um, and I, I think there's a big divide there. Uh, you know, you, you can look at pretty much any different type of competitive shooting. Uh, you know, uh, Three Gun is a great example. You can watch, go on YouTube, search Three Gun competitions, and watch any number of videos where people are doing things that, in my opinion, would get them killed in a gunfight. So, for, an, for example, uh, you see a lot of people, um, if there's like a doorway type thing or some sort of like entry and exit way, transitional area um, being represented on that course, you see a lot of people just post up right in that opening, right in that doorway, and just engage targets totally stationary. Um, you know, doorways are called fatal funnels for a reason. You want to spend as little amount of time in that. Now, I'm, I, I don't want to sound, I don't want to be downplaying three gun. There's a lot of good skills to be developed in three gun. It's a great way to uh, make yourself faster, but I also want to make sure that, you know, you keep it in its context. Um, you know, it has its own benefits, but it doesn't necessarily prepare someone tactically. Um, and to be honest, you know, when, when you watch a lot of the run and gun stuff that nothing fancy does, um, again, what he's doing is not an easy thing. Anyone who's tried to do any of the things that he does in those videos knows that that's not an easy thing to do. The sledgehammer looks like a very physically demanding course and a, uh, a very mentally straining course. That said, you know, there's a lot of just standing stationary in the middle of nowhere. Um, there, he does do some shooting from behind barricades or shooting from the prone, um, but there's also just a lot of standing out in the open, which is one of the worst things you could possibly do in a gunfight. One of the nice things, if there are any nice things about what ISIS is doing overseas, it's giving us a lot of footage, a lot of you know, head cam footage or GoPro footage or whatever, of uh, things working out really negatively for people. Um, and when it's in the case of ISIS fighters, it's a good thing that they are, uh, we are able to learn from their mistakes. Uh, and you can see people do things like standing in the middle of no, in, in the open and uh, not surviving very long while doing it. So um, I don't want to make it sound like these are just my opinions there. You can watch people uh, suffer the consequences of doing a lot of these things. Um, now as far as just being a good shooter, um, I do believe that it is possible to be a good accomplished shooter without taking any of those tactical training courses. Um, there are plenty of people who are able to self-teach that. However, in order to get the skills to be what I would deem a good gunfighter, or what I would consider a good gunfighter, I do think that that's something that you would need some sort of formal training for. Um, there are things that people do, it's really hard to self-perceive. There are things that people do that they're unconscious that they're even doing, um, and things that could be very jeopardizing in, in a life or death situation. And being under the watchful eye of an instructor uh, is, is a really important thing, uh, and there's a lot of skills to be developed there. Now. I, you know, being in the military myself, I've talked to a lot of other people in the military, unless you are yourself a door kicker in the military, the firearms training that you get in the military is laughable. Um, it, it's not very in-depth, it's not very uh, comprehensive, and it's a very questionable quality. And that's kind of how it has to be. You have to appeal to the lowest common denominator. They have hundreds of thousands of people over the decades going through these courses, and they have to make a course that will work for everyone. So by its very nature, it's not that great a training. So, um, and nothing fancy doesn't make any claims that he's an expert marksman or, you know, a tactically sound fighter based on the training he got in the military. Um, so I think that that's one reason why it's important to seek out that training in the civilian, in the civilian sector. There's a lot of bad instructors out there. There's also a lot of really good instructors. So definitely vet your instructors. Look at who, you, who you're looking at taking classes with. Read course reviews. Get an idea for it. Um, but I'll touch on that a little bit at the end when we talk about the, the last myth. So again, while I don't think that you have to take tactical, tactical training courses uh, to be a good shooter, you definitely have to take those courses to be a, a good and effective gunfighter because you don't know what you don't know, um, <laughs> you know, to go back to Donald Rumsfeld's idea. So there are skills that you're not aware that you don't know. Um, there are aspects of gunfighting that you don't know until you, you take a course like that. And, you know, Nothing Fancy makes it very clear that he has never taken any sort of tactical training course, and he almost wears that as a badge of honor. Um, personally, I think it would be very beneficial for him um, to take a course like that, you know, in, in this part of the country, we have some very good high quality training courses out there, training schools out there, um, that I'm sure would love to have him in their course. 
Now, I'm not necessarily saying that he would learn a lot or that he has a lot to learn, but I think it would be very um, eye-opening, at least perspective-wise, of what those courses have to offer, um, because I, I, I think it's unfair for him to make claims about those courses without having taken them himself. So hopefully I've made my point there. So moving on to the next one, uh, your gear must be Fallujah ready. Um, now, I, I, I think that this is a common belief uh, in the tactical world. Um, however, I, I agree with this statement, not necessarily that it has to be Fallujah ready, but that the gear that you use should be durable, reliable, capable of uh, very high volume uh, round counts. It's true, not every gun that you own should be capable or has to be capable of firing 10,000 rounds. However, if I know that I'm trusting my life to a firearm, you know, whether that be my daily carry gun or the guns that I have for, you know, um, some sort of lawless scenario, if I know that it'll last 10,000 rounds, then I know it'll last the two or three rounds that I need to in a, in a defense encounter. I don't have to have that nagging feeling in the back of my head of, uh, you know, I'm starting to get up toward that thousand round count. Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? Um, I I have to have faith in my tools to know that they're going to last when I need them to. So if I know they're going to last 10,000 rounds, yeah, it's true. Most people don't put a thousand rounds through their guns in their lifetime. Um, but if I know that it'll last those 10,000 rounds, I know for a fact it'll last those few rounds when I need it. And also, it may be two, three rounds that I have to shoot in a defensive encounter. It could be much more than that. So I'd be, I'd rather be on the uh, safer side of things than on the optimistic side of things. Uh, being optimistic uh, usually isn't a uh, advisable trait in a, in a gunfight. Um, you know, another thing he brings up, uh, and this is a common thing, so it's not just nothing fancy. Um, I hear this a lot. Well, you know, 22 or 32 has killed more people than uh, any other caliber out there. Um, and while that may be true, I've never seen the statistics myself. Um, I would probably put money on the fact that while a lot of people have been killed by those, more people have survived being shot by those calibers. Um, if, if that's the biggest gun that you can carry, then it is what it is. But, um, I would rather have more gun than I need than not enough. And, um, you know, me personally, I would never tell someone that a 22 is, uh, an adequate firearm for self-protection, but that's just me. If you watch Nut and Fancy's series about AR-15 alternatives, uh, which is a great series, I, I found it really interesting. I recommend you watch that. Um, when he's talking about the SU-16, he he mentions that um, you know, one of the reasons that you probably don't see it in in the competitive uh, arena is because it may be a firearm that uh, would have parts breakages under high volumes of fire. Now, while I think the SU-16 is a good gun, um, any gun that is going to be more prone to parts breakages than, say, just your off-the-rack AR-15 is probably not one that I want to be trusting my life to. But then again, I'm also not going to um, say that if it's been reliable for you, you shouldn't use it. So keep, keep in mind that uh, while there are good options out there, usually there are also better options out there. And trust me, I know... Anything mechanical will break. I worked on fighter jets. Those things broke even when you were optimistic. So I, I get that all mechanical things fail, but some things have a higher tendency of failing um, or will have more catastrophic failures than other things. All right, so moving on. Um, the next one he talks about, the number three one, was the only way to shoot a gun is this way and whatever that one way is. Um, you know... I, this this is a common thing, and I, I, I also disagree with this statement. Um, what works for one person isn't always going to work for other people, whether they have um, physical challenges that they have to overcome or what have you. People's bodies are different, and they can't all do just the one same thing to make it work. However, that said, I also don't think that you can just disregard the uh, developments that have taken place in understanding biomechanics um, and technique and all that. You know, yes, it's true that the military used to teach single-handed uh, pistol shooting. However, we we have progressed. We understand that there are better ways of shooting those guns now. And in my opinion, a bad shooter will be a bad shooter regardless of what stance they're in. I, I think if you have terrible fundamentals, no matter what position your feet are in or your upper body's in or anything like that, if you don't have sight alignment, sight picture, and you don't have trigger control, it doesn't matter what stance you're in. It's not going to work. Um, so I, I do agree that, um, 
that there's no one way to, to do this that's better than all the others. However, that said, there are ways of doing it that do provide a lot of benefits. Um, you know, you look at someone like Travis Haley, who has done extensive research and met with uh, numerous authorities on the topic of biomechanics to understand how the body reacts under recoil and how it moves from position A to position B and what the most uh, efficient and fluid way to move that, you know, your the firearm or your body or anything like that. Um, those Those advances should be taken into account. And if that means you have to change your stance or whatever, um, that's on you if you want to do that. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if, you, if you're if you effective as it is, then don't worry about it. But there are advances that are objectively better for absorbing recoil or for getting faster follow-up shots. So while there is no one way to do things, you still have to be able to take into account some of the new ways of thinking and accept that technology advances or understanding advances and kind of move along with that. And I'll be hitting that um, some more uh, in some of the next uh, topics. You know, when I was an instructor, I had plenty of people who, uh, if they they had very little experience, uh, they wouldn't use what I would call an effective uh, body position or an effective grip or effective other things, and yet they were able to put the rounds exactly where they wanted them to, uh, where, where they wanted them. And in that situation, again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I'm not going to tell you, you have to do it this way. On the flip side, though, if I'm if someone's you know fresh clay and I get to mold them uh, to whatever I think is going to be most effective, then there are definitely more modern techniques that I'll I'll show them because I know it'll benefit them down to benefit them more down the line when they're doing things like shooting and moving, um, or firing high, heavier recoiling firearms or whatever the situation is. So I guess in summary, um, none fancy is correct. There's no one way to do things, but at the same time, I, I think it's um, I, I think it's not beneficial to kind of poo-poo new developments and uh, not take into account what benefits those things offer. So moving on to the next one, uh, if you're in the know, a stock gun isn't good enough. Um, I don't know how widespread this is, at least as far as reputable reputable people in the industry saying this. Uh, I know a lot of people who think that buying the newest whiz bang thing for their gun is going to make them a better shooter. Um, but I definitely agree with Nun Fancy on this that no matter how much money you put into it, if you don't have the fundamentals, it's not going to work for you. Um, you know, one thing to take into account is you look at a lot of law enforcement agencies or even militaries around the world where they are not allowed to alter the 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 gun that they are issued, and they're able to make it work effectively. So. It can certainly be done with a stock gun. Uh, when I got my first Glock 19, um, I probably went through my first 1,500 rounds or so before changing out anything on it. And um, the things that I did change are things that I learned through taking training. Um, like as the sun starts going down and the, the it's getting darker outside, my eyes have a really hard time on those Glock sights picking out that front sight and focusing on that front sight. It's got that big white U in the rear that kind of makes it harder for me at least. Um, so um, you definitely don't need to spend a thousand dollars upgrading your gun to make it usable. Um, but at the same time there are things that make it easier uh, to use or are more ergonomic. Uh, you know red dots were a great advancement and uh, those on rifles are great. Putting night sights on a handgun I think is extremely beneficial um, to the point where I do it on all my guns and I recommend other people do it on theirs because again low light situations can be really hard. So while I know there are people out there who will say, oh man, you bought a Glock, now you have to buy all these other things for it, or you bought this 1911, now you gotta buy all these things for it, or you bought this rifle, now you gotta buy, gotta buy all these things for it, um, that's not true. Um, however, there are things that do make it easier to use or more ergonomic to use or anything like that. All right, uh, the next one. Tattoos make you more tactical. Um, I'm not sure if this is something that people consciously say out loud. I, I've, I've personally never heard it. Um, I don't have any tattoos, uh, and I've also never experienced any, um, any negative uh, feedback from people that because I didn't have tattoos, it didn't make me more tactical. Um, but one thing I want to point out is that tax, uh, tattoos are just popular in the mainstream now anyway, even outside of the tactical and firearm industry. Um, so I think that the uptick in tattoos as a whole 
does also correspond to the uptick in tattoos in, in the tactical world. And, you know, like Nothing Fancy brings up, uh, a lot of those top-tier military guys or even middle-tier uh, military guys do get tattoos. It's kind of a rite of passage for a lot of people. Um, I'm one of the few people in the military that probably didn't have a tattoo uh, or get a tattoo while I was in. Um, so I think that seeing those guys come off the front lines with tattoos and they're teaching classes or pictured in magazines that may contribute to the idea that uh, tattoos make you more tactical. Um, but I don't think that that's something that people consciously think of. Um, if they do think that, then then I agree with Unfancy that that is a myth and it is totally false. All right, so moving on to the next one, which is you need to constantly upgrade your weaponry. Um, you know, especially with how popular modern sporting rifles have become, there's a lot of new manufacturers out there making some pretty stupid, I'll say stupid things. Um, now that said, technology does advance, kind of like I was saying earlier. We learn new things, we adapt uh, to new things, and new things are invented uh, that are objectively better than older things. So for example, you know, one of the red dot sites that Unfancy uh, has been talking a lot about lately, um, which is by all accounts, a great red dot site is the hollow sun with the solar panel on top. Now that makes the battery life uh, extremely long. Something like that is objectively better than a red dot site that battery where the battery will die after four hours. Um, so while I don't necessarily think uh, you need to upgrade your your guns all the time, I don't think that it's something to um, to downplay the importance of kind of adapting to new technology. Um, one thing that Nun Fancy brought up was the DI versus piston debate in AR-15s. And, you know, if, if someone wants to make the blanket, blanket statement that DI guns are better or piston guns are better and everything else is dumb, um, then I agree that, that that's not true. That's not simply not the case. However, the reality is there are situations where a piston gun is going to be more appropriate, you know, short-barreled rifles, uh, suppressed, especially suppressed short-barreled rifles, um, things like that are better for a piston. That said, DI guns are capable of doing it. Um, all my guns are DI, even my SBRs are S uh, DI. Um, so I'm not trying to say that, you know, piston is going to come save the world. It's the greatest gift ever uh, from from the, you know, AR-15 uh, manufacturers out there. Um, but, you know, each have their place, so I, I don't think you can downplay the concept. And, you know, he mentions that uh, guys in World War II were more than happy with their cotton bandoliers, and, um, but, but at the same time, I, I think if you gave them the option of, hey, do you want this cotton bandolier, or do you want to be carrying these plates with these mag pouches and everything else that are going to help protect you and store your equipment more securely, um, I think that they would agree that the newer technology is better and make sure that you know, they have a sta a fighting chance against some of the, at least some of the center mass hits that they might be receiving. So while I agree that you don't need to constantly upgrade uh, upgrade your weapons, there I also think that there's nothing wrong with moving with technology, and as technology and understandings progress, progressing your firearm accordingly. All right, so the next one. Uh, you must advertise to the world of your badassness. Um... So that is something that I see. I don't necessarily think that it's a uh, a concept that is pervasive among I, the representatives, I'll say, of the tactical community. Um, but there are a lot of people who feel like they do have to push it in your face, and that is dumb. Um, you're putting a target on your back when you're walking around. Um, you know, if, if you think of a bad guy coming into a situation, the first one that they're probably going to want to eliminate as a threat is the person saying, hey, I've got guns, watch out for me, you know, with whatever they have on their shirt or anything else. You know, without uh, without fail, when I was working as an instructor um, or as an RSO as well, um, I was helping out with armed security refreshers here. And without fail, every single time we had someone show up with, you know, their plate carrier and the word security on a patch on their chest and on their back and they had to make this big show that hey I'm armed security those guys always shot worse than the guys who kinda came in kept their mouth shut were very unassuming got the job done and left um, the people who felt like they had to advertise it you usually were not that good um, and even same goes for the, the firearms courses that we did 
Typically, the people who came in to show, hey, I'm such a badass, usually didn't do as well as the people who kind of kept, or not kept to themselves, but let their actions speak for them. So I don't have a whole lot of disagreement with that fancy on this one. Uh, the next one, can't, camo makes you a badass. Um, honestly, I think when I when I walk around town, maybe it's just the, the circle that I'm in, the, the environment that I'm in, um, I don't really see a lot of... Uh, people wearing camo to kind of shout, hey, I'm a badass. Um, you know, hunting is a huge thing around here, so I see people in Realtree all the time, but it's probably because uh, they're they're coming back to buy supplies to go back out uh, on a hunt or whatever the situation is. Um, so I don't, I don't know who the people are who are saying that camo makes you a badass. Um, that said, camo does provide a tactical advantage in a lot of situations. Similar to Nut and Fancy being here on the western side of the United States, being in Oregon, um, we have everything from, you know, green tree covered mountains to big wide open plains areas uh, in, in the eastern side of the state and everything in between. So having something like multicam does kind of provide a, a tactical advantage. So I don't want to make people think that you're dumb if you wear camo or your gear is camo. Um, but if you think that your gear has to be camo because that's what makes you cool or that's what makes you better than other people then, yeah, that's that's not the case. That's dumb. Um, but, again, I don't think that you should underplay the, the tactical advantage of, of having camouflage. All right, so the next one um, was you can be a tactical expert through virtual reality experience, i.e. video games like Battlefield, Call of Duty, or just solely by watching YouTube videos. Um, this is one of the ones where... I have no idea who would seriously say something like this. I know I've heard people jokingly say, like, oh, I play Call of Duty, this is, you know, nothing for me, um, when in regards to, like, shooting actual firearms. Um, but I don't know a single person who says this seriously. If they do believe that seriously, then they are delusional, um, and that, that is a myth that should be debunked. But I also don't think that this is a myth that needs debunking. I don't think anyone... Uh, who is reasonable honestly believes this. Um, if you do, then I highly encourage you to take a training course and s find out how misguided you are and see the things that you don't know. Um, but to me, this is just one big straw man. I don't, I don't know where this is coming from. Again, I'm sure with uh, the amount of people that Nunfancy reaches that that's something that's out there, but I, I, I've never experienced it seriously. Um, and I... <laughs> I would hope that that's not a myth that needs debunking. Um, and then the, the very last one um, is, if you're not credentialed, you are not worthwhile. Now, this is the only one um, on this entire list of 10 that I think is a very extant um, myth in, in the firearms community as a whole and in the tactical community especially. Um, there are a lot of people who think if you weren't a door kicker, um, if you weren't, you know, top tier secu uh, special operations, special forces, what have you, um, that you're not worth learning from. And I think there is plenty of evidence to the contrary. Um, there are a lot of very high quality instructors who have no military or law enforcement background um, or who have maybe limited military backgrounds where they weren't those top tier operators. Um, you know, I'm sure that you guys can in your head while I'm saying this, can think of multiple ones, so I don't have to name anyone by name, um, but there are plenty of people out there um, who are high-quality instructors without having that, that background or pedigree. Um, and there are people who do think that if, if you weren't one of those people, then you're not worth training with, and I, I think they're wrong. And I think that also contributes to the amount of uh, stolen valor that exists in the instructor, uh, in the instructor realm because people feel like they have to have that background, they might uh, embellish stories about what their military experience was, if at all. Um, and uh, I think that's a very negative thing, and I think it misleads a lot of good people who are well-intentioned and, you know, are listening to what these people say without, without merit. You know, being in the chair force myself, especially in a non-combat, at least not direct combat job, um, I'm not going to tell you that uh, you have to have uh, a huge amount of door kicking experience to, to be a valuable asset. Now that said, I also think that it is worth stating that there is an immense amount of, uh, of value to having people who have 
actually put these skills into practice in real world scenarios and been shot at or you know had to use these skills to to kill other people uh, that that needed it at the time um, so there is a tremendous amount of value there um, you know a guy that I used to work with had a lot of first-hand experience of hey when you're shooting around a corner uh, make sure your outside knees down if you're kneeling because otherwise your femoral artery is just out there hanging out in the wind and he knows people who didn't make it back from overseas because that was something that was a mistake that they made. Um, so again, I think there's tremendous value there. Um, and, and, I, and I don't think that's something that should be discounted. But again, I don't think that's also a prerequisite for being an instructor or being uh, useful to listen to. So that's, that's the 10 that he gave. That's my perspective on those 10. Again, hopefully I was able to kind of articulate my position and why I think the way I do. Um, again, I think a lot of these are um, kind of a straw man of the tactical community. I don't know people who honestly believe 80% of these. But again, I'm sure people do exist out there who believe these things. And again, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to trash nothing fancy. Uh, I have a lot of respect for what he does um, and, and the, the content that he puts out. I still watch review videos of his before I buy a firearm because I know, hey, at least when he's do doing a review of that firearm, I know he's been out there and shot it and at least put it through some sort of uh, harsher environment than the guys who just open up a box and say, yeah, this gun's great. Look how cool it looks. You better go buy one, having never put a single round through it. So that, that stuff drives me crazy. So I definitely have a lot of respect for what Nothing Fancy does. Um, I will continue to, to consume the, the uh, content that he puts out. I recommend that, you know, if, if, if you enjoy watching his videos, I don't want this video to change that. Now, I'm sure I also am going to be ruffling some feathers with this video, um, and I'm sure you guys will let me hear it in the comment section below. I don't plan on, um, you know, disabling comments on this video, so I'm definitely open to hearing what you guys have to say. Um, if you think that I didn't state a point well enough, please let me know. Um, if you think there are other things that I should have said, again, let me know in the comment section below. I'm not trying to start a war here. I just wanted to add my voice to the conversation. Um, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, throw those in the comments below. I try to stay on top of that as best I can. But as always, I hope you're able to get something out of this video, and I really appreciate you watching.